All right, everyone. Uh, we are going to get started now. Thank you again for joining us. It looks like we're going to have a few more people logging on as we get started, but I would like to introduce Dave Hunter, the owner of Crown Bees. Uh, he's going to be taking us through today's live stream. And Dave, take live, it away. Huh? All right, good to go. Hey, before we even get started, uh, there's a lot of people involved in this little event. Carl mentioned that we've got Joy and Damaris on chat. Hey, Carl, come here, just real quick. I just want to, no one ever gets any <laughs> okay. screen time. Hold okay. it. Here's, here's Carl. He's, oh, he's got things in his ears. He's unwinding. Oh my gosh. Come on, Carl. Come all the way over. <laughs> okay. Here Everybody. is, so this <laughs> two guys with lots of hair yep. trying to help out. And, and Joy and Damaris on the chat. So feel free to be talking at us during this entire live stream. Good to see you. Sorry about that, Carl. Now he's got to go no, put no, things no, back no, in his ears. Plug back in again real quick. Okay, so normally, right, back. <laughs> normally we've got uh, a big event just here locally, Woodenville, Washington, kind of little suburb of, of Seattle. Hundreds of people will be rotated through here on a weekend. And just because of COVID, uh, this has given us the opportunity to uh, reach out to the whole well, world. We've had people in Ireland last weekend. So let's, let's get going. You know, what are, what are we doing? Uh, this is, let me get my mouse in the right place. Um, this is a company, small company, that cares, all right? We care about the bee health. We care about, uh, well, every bee. You know, we're, we're trying to help you be successful. Your success, honestly, is important. This is why we're sharing what we're doing with you. We, oh gosh, we've been thinking through all sorts of things for the past uh, 12 or 13 years of how to just get every nuance of healthiest bee we can. And lastly, we collaborate. We're working with our peers, we're working with the researchers. We, we wanna make sure that uh, collectively, what we learn in the world, you're able to hear as well. Okay, so this is, um, this is a get to do for us. So kind of in the, in the short story, some of you might not even know what's a mason bee. Okay, so here is, um, this is a, this is a, cute little dried up bee from last year. This is a, a blue orchard mason bee. And what she does is each, each female in the spring chooses her own little hole and she nests back in here gathering pollen, a little bit of nectar, lays an egg, and then uh, seals that little chamber with mud and then working her way out, pollen, egg, mud, pollen, egg, mud, out to the end. And she finishes, we'll open these things up, but she finishes in here. So once the bee has lived for her five to six short weeks, she's gone. She dies. Sometimes we'll find them inside the, uh, the reed or the tube or the, or the wood tray. Um, but the eggs that she's laid are next year's bees. So through the summer, that little egg, it, it hatches, it eats all the pollen inside there, sp uh, becomes a big larva, uh, spins a cocoon. And then ultimately um, changes into an adult bee by about now. Okay, and so along with these bees, um, there are other things inside here. We'll get into them. But so um, here's just a little small piece of what goes on inside the mason bee hole. But we want you to have more bees. Okay, and so we want you to understand in nature these holes are spread apart. They're everywhere in your yard, in a tree, in a hole of your house. Okay, but we want to have holes tight together. And when we pull these holes tight together, pests are able to walk through every single little hole. And so we're going to find that by, um, this is easier for us, it actually um, winds up with more pests inside here. No big deal. This is part of nature. This first year, bees and pests are inside here. Now, if we do nothing, we don't harvest, okay? This following season, next spring, you've got these pests still in these holes. The mason bees will leave, but they're not that smart. Oh, look, here's a hole that someone else used last year. They're gonna go back into that hole with the pests already there, and they're bringing in more pests from the field. So over the time, every year and in year out, you just have more pests, less bees. Ultimately, you have holes that just never open up. And so because we want you successful, we like bees, we're gonna help you learn 
why harvesting is a good thing. We're going to find some gross people, gross things inside here. All right, so um, we want you to harvest. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to uh, open up nesting holes. We're going to find out what's inside these holes. We're going to sort out the pests. And then we'll talk a little bit about a bee buyback program. This is really important to us to get bees from across the country. We're going to um, get rid of the debris. There's feces. There's a lot of gross things inside here. We're going to show you how to wash cocoons, how to clean them, and how to store these things. It's really easy. Sounds like a lot. It's really easy. Okay, so let's get going. First of all, um, bamboo is a wonderfully structurally sound hole. Okay, Very, very hard to open up. We've tried opening it up with a buck knife and hitting it with a hammer. You can open up bamboo, but in general, it's brutally tough and it's probably not safe for either the bees or for yourself. So if you have bamboo and it's out there everywhere, we recommend not open it up. Rather, uh, in the spring, we've got a, a video that we've called a moving day that talks about how to move things from these bamboo houses to uh, healthier holes that you can open up. Carl, did you have a link for that? What were we going to do on here? Um, yeah, we have actually, uh, we have a link to that page on our site. And if Damaris, if you could pop that link into the chat right about now, and we'll also add it to the description of this video. Um, it's really important to uh, see how easy it is to transition from bamboo to natural reeds. Okay. So first things first, you're at home. Um, there's going to be dirt and pollen and, and I don't know, earwigs, things are going to kind of crawl out. So having a clean space, um, I've got things kind of nicely arranged, but like a newspaper or something in front of you, because there's going to be, there's going to be crud out in front of us. Okay. Um, so our, our first thing is I've got a bunch of reeds that were at my house. And you can see, if you look at the ends of this, some of them have um, mudded over holes. And I don't know if you can see closely, some might have the bees partially filled. Can, some might can you hold a little empty. bit uh, more close to me? Yeah, there you go. There right you go. There. Thanks. Okay. So as I go through here, I don't want to open up a reed that doesn't have anything in it. So I'm going to, first of all, take my reeds that I've got and find the ones that are completely filled up. And I'm going to set those aside because those are easy. Because I'm... And actually, as you look at this, look at the different and look at the mud colors. There's dark mud and there's light mud. Man, these bees in my yard are finding mud from all different sources. There's nothing just one, one piece out there. If you use our mason bee mud, you'll notice that that mud is very gray. Okay, so I got these, I got a couple more. So what I'm trying to do is to get down and find the partially filled I can see down the ends of these. Okay. So you're now, you're separating separating the these reeds are all, that have caps. These from, are all the capped ones that I know the bees have used. Uh -huh. Now I've got just a little. This is just a skewer. You can use really anything. I'm just going to go down inside here, and if I push this back here, look how far back this reed goes. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to go into here. I hit the end right there. So I know. This particular reed has something in it. Okay. Hey, Dave, so could you show us that again? Just uh, move your hand a little bit lower down so we can see the. Sure, let's take this one. Here's my reed. Um, it looks empty, but as I push this skewer into it, it stops right about here. So uh, the I mason yeah. bee, she finished. It's a partially filled reed. So my intent here, I'm not going to put this back into my pile. My intent is to quickly go through here and find ones that are, that's easy. And some of these might have, no, nope, that's got something in it. And they all might, but I, I do, okay, there's, I know it's only there, so I'm taking this guy out. And, okay, this one's all the way to the end, so I'm not going to, I don't want to ruin that read. Hey, hey, Dave, while you do that, I just want to uh, reiterate for everyone that's watching. Um, today, we are talking about harvesting mason bee cocoons from natural reeds. Um, I know a lot of people may have leaf cutter bees um, that they're looking to harvest. This event is not for 
leafcutter bees. You actually want to hang on to all those. Um, Damaris, if you could pop uh, a link in the chat um, regarding harvesting leafcutter bees, uh, but stay tuned. We will definitely be doing that, but not today. Good point, Carl. And actually, beforehand, I opened some of the reeds just to get a little start on some things. And I did find these reeds had been in my backyard the entire summer. Normally you're supposed to take um, when bees have finished, you take them out when the bees are kind of done. So maybe June I should have pulled them in. But yes, here is actually, um, these are leaf cutter cocoons. Um, in fact, it's uh, since I left it inside there, I can see on one side, here's a mason bee cocoon. Okay. And this leaf cutter bee put her, you know, so, so that it was partially filled whole. And oh then here's gosh. the leaf cutter pieces here. And I even... <laughs> Well, I don't even know how this happened. Here's a Mason Bee cocoon on the other side. So, okay, all sorts of fun things happen inside these holes. All right, so I now have, um, I've chosen, I've pulled out, these reeds are all empty. I'm saving those for next year. And all these reeds in front of me now have uh, cocoons in them. So, I'm ready to go. I'm, the easiest way to open a reed is to... I'm just going to take, there's the closed end and the open end that was mudded. I'm just going to push this with my finger just like that. And I'm going to split this apart and see what's inside here. Okay. So in this cocoon, I had a little mud cap that's fallen out. This is, um, this is nectar, uh, pollen and nectar inside here. These are cocoons. This looks like pollen and nectar here. And um, I might gross a couple people out, but one, one of the things that we do here at Crown Bees is we've learned that uh, the pollen and nectar is unbelievably sweet. The nectar in here is really good. So to taste it, you just taste that um, very rich thing. Okay, if you work here, this is, we've even held people down. You have to. <laughs> we, we've all done it. We've Everyone done has it. to taste a little bit of nectar just to see how it tastes. It really tastes good. Kind of gross, but um. No, no, it's not gross at all. It's no, it's, it's just it's new and different, but it's it's really a a, a it, cool experience. It's, it's a, so if you get just a pollen ball, you'll see there's nothing else but but only pollen. Consider consider eating it. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna scoop out. I've got with me a cocoon comb uh, that uh, has a mason bee side and a leaf cutter side. Normally we use this mostly for our wood trays. Um, but we've also learned that just the tip of these things, as we push things out of a reed, this is useful. And you you're notice there's, there's a lettered side and a non-lettered side. I'm actually holding the letters in my hand. As I'm coming through, it's actually scooping underneath and pushing things out. This is what we use. So now I'm just going to go through. It could take me a little bit. So if you're doing this, do this along with me. Here is a moment. Take your reeds and just start scrunching through them. Okay, so I'm... And, and as you do this, um, if you find things other than mason bee cocoons inside these reeds, uh, go ahead and snap a picture of them. Um, you can post them to Instagram uh, with the hashtag cocoon harvest 2020. Um, and we have Damaris and Joy, and after the show, Dave will be on there to help us help you identify uh, any sort of pests um, or interesting things that you find inside uh, your, your nesting holes. So this is a good example. These are partition walls. So here the bee went in there, laid all the pollen, laid her egg, but she um, separated this chamber with a little bit of mud. And so I'm just pushing this mud down. So there's just partitions in there. You're going to be pushing right through. Hey Dave, could you show this, show us that again? I, well, Whoops. Ne <laughs> next Sorry, one. I had, to, I had <laughs> yeah. the wrong camera. Okay, okay, hold a second. Oh, okay, now we can get. Um, okay, here's the right camera. Here's the partitions, now and this is see. called an egg chamber inside here. And it's surprising. I'm not finding. Um, well, here's this is an interesting little piece. This little this was this little chunk right there. That's a dead larva. Right there, Carl? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so that's a dead larva. Just didn't, um, just didn't make it. And I don't, um, 
There's a couple of them actually inside here. These little pieces here, um, I, they caught cold. I don't know what happened. But, but this they is, were those were the eggs that ate the pollen loaf, but then didn't spin the cocoon. Correct. So the egg turns into a larva. The larva starts consuming the pollen, and uh, these just died for some reason. And I, I'm just putting in my debris pile. Okay, so let's go through. Uh, inside here, oh gosh, okay, so these, this, <laughs> these are messy reeds. Um, molds in here, I've got leaf cutters on the backside. Ooh, that really says that these were left out for a year. Not a, not a good, not a great example. Okay, so I'm getting, I'm finding cocoons, and I'm making this, a mess. Dave, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask Damaris if there are any questions so far from the chat. Uh, Damaris, are there, do you, are there any questions from the chat that we could post to Dave right now? And I am making a good mess. But I'm not finding any really... Um, here are cocoons. Here's leaf cutter cocoons. Um, okay, Dave, we have uh, one question. If you wouldn't mind, like uh, right now when you're opening up the reeds, mm -hmm. Um, if you could hold it a little bit further towards me while you actually open the reed, um, the next one, uh, just so people can see and, and maybe explain to them exactly how you're doing it, uh, the, the pinching ah. the top. Okay. Um, and, so, and maybe maybe showing the, those other, couple other tools that you have there. Okay. So simplest for me is to, again, I'm going to pinch this. So here's the, um, here's the end. It actually has, you can see this ring around there. That's the node. I'm on this side and right here, I'm just pinching, grabbing and just pulling apart. Okay, so again inside here we can see, ah, this is a good example of, um, in here is a pollen loaf, this little black stuff right there, ooh, gross, what's that? Well, on all these things, that's mason bee poop, that as the larva was out there, consumed all the pollen, spun the cocoon um, as it's as it's eating the pollen has metabolic waste this is it just well that's poop and as it spins its cocoon it pushes that feces out frass on the outside of the cocoon so this is just very normal this is what we expect to see in all of our cocoons and I, if I didn't have a cocoon comb I could use here's a screwdriver I'm just using a screwdriver to get things out super easy in fact, if I really wanted to, I'm going to open this up again. I could use the other side of the reed uh, to just push through. Hey, Dave, uh, we've got um, we've got people finding various things besides cocoons. I was wondering if you could show us an example of chalk brood. This is something that people are seeing. Okay, so chalk brood is, we have this, we found these in our wood trays. Chalk brood is, uh, looks just like this thing here. A little bit closer to you. To me? There you go. Right about there, okay. Yeah. So this little thing, it's a very friable surface. As I push this in, you can see it kind of breaks apart. This is a spore, okay? So just a few little grains of this spore of the spore inside the, the pollen mass, as the larva egg hatches, there's a larva, starts eating that pollen mass, as there's just a couple little grains of this in there, uh, it, it's perfectly matched to the bee's chemistry. It turns in, it dies, the larva dies, makes a little C shape, and then this spore expands, and it's just this uh, very insidious little thing. If you do nothing with this, the mason bees behind here in this year would be tunneling out. They're going to go past, they're going to chew past this spore. It's going to get all over their furry bodies, all over their feet. It's going to stay on the front of the mason bee house. It's going to be pushed into your yard. 
and even still, it's down this hole. So the bee's out. Some other bee is next year is going to move into this hole, and now she's walking past this spore, and she's pulling the spore up and down this hole. Okay, this is a nasty spore that will uh, spread through everything. This is one of the main reasons, you know, these types of pests that you want to harvest. Okay, so that's, this is chalk brood. Thanks, Dave. Uh, let me open a couple more, then I want to show you some, um, as I'm looking at this particular reed that I opened up, it's kind of, um, it's kind of moldy inside here. Uh, I don't know why it's moldy, probably excess moisture during, might have been raining when this bee was in here. Um, no big deal. A little bit of mold isn't going to um, kill the bees, so I'm just going to push those out, and as we clean them... So, so moldy cocoons doesn't mean... Uh, no, it doesn't mean death, no. death and destruction. Okay. Okay, another way to open these holes, just a second, let me get in here and push these out. Um, some people have... Um, we get a lot of reeds from across the country in our bee buyback program, and we get thousands of reeds, and your fingers really get tired, honestly. Ask Joy. Say, hey, Joy, send her a text. How do your fingers feel at the end of the season? <laughs> it, can, it can be a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> so, ah, different types of fingers, okay? So, all I'm doing, same thing. I'm just in here, just breaking the reed. All I did was just break the reed. Now I can spread it open. And again, I'm just using something to get them out. Another path years ago that we tried out, um, here's just a regular old butter knife. I'm going to put this down on the table. But as I just put the end into this, I'm able to, tw I'm able to twist the reed and open it up and then find the cocoons on the inside. So just a maybe way to... open the reed. And these reeds, um, they're kind of a consumable. I would throw them away. Okay, so I think you get the idea. As you walk all the way through, we're opening, we're getting cocoons out, and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna hopefully you guys have gotten it. We've, we've got a few different ways to do this. But here are here are cocoons from this year. I'm going to open maybe two more. And then the other thing that you, I haven't seen yet, these are from my yard. I'm out here in the Seattle area. And around the Seattle area is a pest called, a brand new pest called the Houdini fly. And this Houdini fly, oh my gosh. Uh, okay, these are huge mounds. Uh, pollen comes in different colors, okay? These are huge mounds, and boy, if I had um, if I had some way of capitalizing on these things, this is, is breakfast. Oh my gosh, it's packed with I don't know what flower power. Yeah, they're power, super I guess. nutritious. Oh. From what I hear, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, it was like too too juicy to ignore. Um. So yeah, you were talking about Houdini flies. <laughs> sorry. Okay, and I got caught in there. Okay, so I don't see anything inside here, but these are. Um, this, this whole pile of, of cocoons, we've been harvesting this week. And inside this, um, inside this little piece here is this, it's an orangey colored um, poop. And you see inside here, these, there's these tiny little, uh, tiny little maggots, okay? Um, this, these things right here, they're real sticky. And we find them, here's a whole pile of what this uh, frass looks like. And in here are just tons of little fly eggs, larvae. So what happens, this fly is spreading everywhere. Came from Europe maybe four or so years ago. This, it's a fly, it looks like a fruit fly, real small piece. Carl, do we have a um, picture of what the adult fly looks like? Um, Let's see if you can find that while I, show a little bit more. I will try to grab that and put it up, but if not, you can take a look at our website, which we've got a lot of pictures of these guys. Um, Damaris of Joy, if you could put a, a, a link, link to, to the that Houdini. in our chat, that'd be great. Yeah, to the Houdini fly. Okay, so if you find 
a whole bunch of little larvae in one little cell, that's a big deal. Okay, what, what this fly does, let me actually keep that out. What this fly does, it lays a whole bunch of eggs inside there. It's perfectly in tune with our mason bee season. These um, maggots eat all the pollen ahead of our mason bee. So now it's just maggots inside there. They sit all summer long, all winter long as maggots. And then um, in the spring, they metamorphose into a fly like that. And they move out with the mason bees and they just sit there on the outside of the house. And these flies fly, I don't know how far, half a mile to other places. They will quickly overrun everything. So Seattle has them, Portland has them. We worked with the invasive, um, uh, invasive species people from Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. We know people from Seattle have sent unopened holes out to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. Okay, so it's a big deal. Um, you know, some people are seeing um, like holes in their cocoons and the cocoons are kind of like empty. Uh, do you have any examples of that or, or yeah, can you explain what that I is? Do. Um, there are other little critters out there. These are two little, um, is that about the right height, Carl? Uh, a little bit closer to me. Okay, so let me get a little something here. Um, there. To, uh, to you, to you. To me, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so these little, there's a bunch of little holes inside these cocoons. And essentially what's happened here, there's um, carpet beetles, there's beetles and other little, um, you might find there are moths, um, cornmeal moths, will walk through the entire hole, they chew right through the wood or the mud partitions and eat the nesting bee. So this is what the shell looks like. Let me show you an example of, um, I think we have some little carpet beetles in here. And when you find something that doesn't look like a cocoon, you're, ah, so here, right here, are little cute ah. beetles that are, um, their job is to kind of just chew through things and um, lay eggs and have more food. So this wow. is, um, in fact, ah, so those are adult beetles. And I think, ah, right here are the, um, we can see that right there. These are the juvenile stage. Okay, so these are the guys that are more destructive. They'll be the ones chewing through. The adult bees just lay eggs, or beetles leave, leave eggs. So this is a carpet beetle, and that'll, um, if you do nothing, they will um, build chew through everything. So that's kind of the pest. This is, um, I've got inside here um, cocoons and kind of poop and a lot of pollen mass. I've got little pieces of my reed that I don't care about. I've got um, leaf cutter pieces that I don't really want to get wet. Right, because the mason bee cocoons are, are waterproof. waterproof. We're going to learn that. Yeah. And the leaf cutter ones aren't. Okay, so I'm going to pull these out. Um, let's, let's, let me catch up here on my, I've been talking for a second. Um, okay, so we have talked about, let me, let me summarize to catch the slides up just, because if, if you're watching this later on in a, um, in a, in the recording, you'll see what's happening. So we've pulled things apart. We've scraped out the cocoons and the debris. Uh, we've talked about pollen mites. Ah, um, I found, oh gosh, where, um, rubber I band thought band. I saw some earlier ah, right here. on that ah, tray. Right here. Okay. Um, I, as we're opening up a lot of things here, I'm trying to find inside this piece, uh, I mean, I'd open it up and I wanted to seal it again. So watch this. Let me get this back. Okay. So inside this, oh my gosh. Yeah, inside this, this is just thousands and thousands of little pollen mites. Okay, so what's, what these guys do, a pollen mite, this, was, this is thousands of tiny little mites. What their job is to do is they just eat pollen. So they're in their yard, and as the bee brings back the pollen, she's bringing back the pollen mite with her. And it's a race, in, in most cases, so she brings a lot of pollen mites back, these guys just uh, consume all the pollen. The egg just doesn't have any, you know, if the bee even comes out. Can I show that video of them? Show them what the... they look like live. It's really okay. gross. Yeah, so what you can see here, all the little white dots moving around are the pollen mites. And the yellow, of course, is the pollen. And you see them carrying it away. 
Um, luckily for these mason bees, they've already eaten their pollen and turned into larvae, and they're obviously spinning their cocoons. But um, yeah, you can see these guys just munching away, and then it ends up filling up your reed. Okay, um, so Carl, do you have an example of, so that's, this is the, there's egg, there's juvenile stage, and then once these guys to be a big um, pollen mite, they piggyback in the spring. So a bee on the back side is going to true through that chamber. You've now got mites that are in adult stage and they piggyback on the bee. And sometimes yep. will bees just be super overloaded and they're now bringing the mites back out to your yard. And those other mites have stayed inside the hole. You know, so it's, it's just another bug. Carl, do you have an example of yeah, yeah, I just put adult. up on the screen. You can see the mites um, that were left in the nesting hole. Uh, this bee uh, emerged, crawled through those mites, and now those mites are just sitting on its back. I've taken a lot of macro photography of these bees, and it's really sad to see, well, sad. It's just kind of weird to see all these mites just on their back because the bees can't reach their back to clean them off. It's also on various parts of, like, under their wings and around their legs, places that they can't reach to clean behind their head. Um, so it's really important that we get these uh, pollen mites out. Okay, and here's another example. I just opened up. This chamber here is full of the mites. Here's cocoons, and so these bees would have carried out there. Mm -hmm. um, to contrast what Carl said, um, years ago, I had a tray completely full of pollen mites. It was just a big sea of pollen mites, and I experimented, and I dropped a bee into it. And it came out, uh, you know, Dave, the science man. So I dropped the bee into there and just came out completely covered. You could see the antennas. And I, I put the bee on a little someplace where I could watch it. And it took about five minutes. And the bee kept on getting every single thing off it could. And finally, within about five minutes, all the pollen mites are off, except for it couldn't get between its wings. Mm -hmm. So it yeah, does carry that. it out. I see that a lot. But a lot of them, um, uh, it's just part of, it's part of nature's way. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship that I like bees more than I like pollen mites. I like bees more than I like chalk brood, uh, more than carpet beetles. More. So this is why we're harvesting. Okay, so um, we found tunneling worms. We showed you chalk brood. Um, if you've opened, if you left the reeds out during the whole summer, you might find today large larva. Okay, now what's this? It didn't metamorphose. It's a summer something. Okay, it could be a summer bee. It could be a summer um, wasp. So there are solitary wasps that will go into the hole, bring prey back with them, uh, a, mo um, a worm or a grasshopper or a lacewing. They'll bring them back there, parasitize that little bug, and then seal that chamber with sometimes mud, sometimes uh, grass blades. And then the larva, the, you know, the wasp larva eats through the prey, turns into a big old larva, and just sits there waiting to metamorphose out next year. If you find these, just pull the, the larva out and put them into a little container and store those in your garage. Uh, whether it's a bee or a wasp, they're good guys. And we'll show you what to do with those in the spring. Okay, so I am, um, I'm done. If you found anything, just toss it to us. You can even toss it to us later on during the week. We'll be answering um, everything we can because we're looking for you guys to be successful. Okay, so. Um, now that I have, I've got this pile of reeds that I am actually just throwing away. And I have inside here cocoons and pollen mites and dead little thingies. And I'm just going to get rid of this. We want to get rid of the pollen mite. We want to get rid of, uh, if, I, if I didn't wash anything, just put them back out there. These mites are now with your bees going out to the field. If I had chalk brood in here, it's a, it, I don't want to have chalk brood spread to things. We've, to the field. We've learned that there's, um, as we're working with various universities, that there's other pathogens that are on the outside of the cocoons. Okay, so all of these things we're going to try to get rid of because we want you successful with your bees. Um, so what we're going to do, oh, actually very simple, uh, around crown bees, let me clean my table up real quick, like. Hey, while you do that, Dave, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to ask Damaris, do we have any questions from the chat so far that we can recap with Dave?
to uh, get through all these things. You can toss this all in the water. Some things float, some things sink. Uh, but we've got just a simple, these are, um, these are gold mining trays. If you found um, a quarter inch hole or an eighth inch hole, something like that, the um, bees typically don't fall through, eighth inch holes. So I'm gonna have, um, these are even tinier holes. So I'm gonna put my larger holes on my, up here. I'm gonna pour everything into my gold, gold pans and I'm just gonna sit here and watch everything fall through. The cocoons are very durable. I'm actually moving my hands um, roughly on here, just trying to push through things that I don't need. Hey Dave, a, a question that we're getting a lot is, um, what do you actually do with the pests after you find them and separate them? I'm not really a pest lover. <laughs> and so the question is, so what do I do with the pests? I'm typically um, throwing them in my compost pit. Okay, so that's my excess, um, well, whatever it is, my, my Houdini flies, I might actually throw those away, um, but I'm throwing them away. Good. It's a good question. And, and another one, you mentioned compost. Uh, the reeds, when, once you've uh, cracked them open and cleaned out the cocoons, um, are they compostable? Oh, absolutely. Reeds are, it's, it's, a, it's a grass. It's a large grass. Okay, so I, my big things stayed on my um, eighth inch holes. I've got some little males that slipped on through, and I don't want to throw those away. So I'm just going to pick through and find just a few of the males. Uh, the difference between a female mason bee and a, um, let me find a, females get all of the pollen. Uh, you're, you're, as the mason bee is, is gathering the pollen, she knows she's going to fertilize the egg on the, here's the, here's the node. She's going to go to the back end of the reed and put a lot of pollen back here. Okay. So pollen, egg, whatever. But on the on the inside section, she's laid a lot of pollen and fertilized those eggs. Those will wind up being big cocoons. On the outside section, where birds can get to things, these are the males, and she's kind of starved them. She's got less pollen and unfertilized. So a smaller cocoon is a male, a larger cocoon is a female. And that's pretty consistent of all the mason bee species. So I've got... Um, everything out of these trays that is B, and whether I throw this away or put them in my compost pit, I'm getting rid of the debris. So now we look at, we look at what came through here. This is just a lot of debris that I don't have going into my water. So uh, not everyone has a tray, and actually these, this stuff could, could sink, so it's not that big of a deal. We work through thousands of bees so we're sifting everything right so yeah because we have a lot water. of mud through right. our water so it's a it's a nice thing to do but it's not super necessary it's not super necessary okay so what i'm going to um we're typically putting everything into water at this point okay so here's all my cocoons and i'm going to go put these in um i'm going to pour cold water into this and let them sit for three to five minutes. Uh, what's going to happen during these, this time, the mason bee cocoons are waterproof. Okay, Think of, actually, there's bees that nest underground, and the water table goes up and down, and these the cocoons are waterproof. So these could probably sit inside water for close to an hour or so. No big deal. Um, but what we learned is that when you've got these wet, the mud pretty much falls off, and it's really easy to agitate. So we're gonna right, do it just makes it makes them easier to clean. Makes them easier to clean. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna um, hypothetically I'm gonna be pouring water on this, but we we tape this one little section. So I'm gonna carry this tray off the camera. I'm gonna go pour water onto it, and you'll see uh, me washing cocoons real quick, like. Okay. So now this is me, and I've got. Um, just my bin and I'm tossing just a pile of cocoons and debris into just a, a this is a colander, you could use a strainer, and I'm just gonna, um, they're all wet. They sat inside the water for three or four minutes, 
And now I'm just pouring on water. You could use a garden hose with super high power water. Uh, the cocoons are very, very durable. It looks like I'm being mean, but I'm not. These are just waterproof, very robust. They're bugs. You know, I know, I know they're loving bees, but but well, we want to get that crud off. We want to get know, that crud off our loving bees. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is just me. And I'm as I'm agitating them, I've got the mud and the pollen mites falling off through the little holes and making my water real dirty down there. Okay. So I'm even, I think at this point here, I'm putting a whole lot of water in there because I just want to um, get them as clean as possible. So there, we've got things relatively clean. And I'm just going to toss them inside here. And we're going to carry this back to my desk. Actually, let me uh, sit here and get my desk area a little clean again. Uh, it's sat for two, three minutes. We went through, um, and we now have cocoons. These were all wet from uh, just before we started video and I got these all wet. So I'm gonna put them onto my little towel here and as we look at it these cocoons are um, there's a here was one that I didn't clean just had sitting around so this right here is a uh, dirty cocoon this is a clean cocoon and that's just from running it through just the running water. through water and agitating and you know in in nature these things are all there. I mean, in nature, nothing happens. But again, we're trying to get the bees as healthy as possible. And so we just know there's not great things on the outside. So this is why we're cleaning cocoons. Um, we've patted it dry. So I, I've done this. I've just kind of, I'm not doing anything uh, more than just getting the cocoons wet. Okay. So we, I want to introduce, so we have uh, our bee buyback program. What's, uh, what's important about this in, our, in my company is that we believe that bees raised locally do best there. And so we have customers like you out in Pennsylvania or New York or Minneapolis that have too many cocoons. They send, you know, send the bees to us in the mail. These are just robust cocoons that we're getting all the time in the mail. We clean them, we walk them through, make sure they're all healthy, and then we send them back to those same places. So you'll hey see. Hey Dave, uh, just real quickly, yeah. how do people know how many bees they need and, and how do they know the, uh, which bees are extra? Hold that thought. Okay, <laughs> give, give me one slide. Yes, okay. okay. We'll right. talk about it. Um, <laughs> as you can see, this little map here, these are ecoregions. It's the same climate zone inside all these things here. So we try to track the bees from these areas, kind of head back to these areas. This is, this is um, the importance of uh, this company, we care. So uh, we would like some of your excess bees. How many cocoons do you need to hold? Okay, so um, if you take the reeds that we had here, a pack of reeds, maybe 50 reeds in there, every cocoon has in it about maybe six or so bees, okay? What we think is best is about maybe one cocoon per nesting hole. Some bees are going to fly away, but one female can lay about two uh, reeds. So, so if you're going to have uh, 50 nesting holes in your yard, you should keep... You might keep... need 50, maybe even keep 100 cocoons, mm -hmm. okay? Keep and what about, what about the male to female ratio? So, you know, like they don't want to keep all the big cocoons, right? Right, right. So in... Good question. So in all of these, we see uh, large and small cocoons again, okay? Um, what's important when you've got the cocoons that you want to have roughly four females to six males is kind of nature's average. So as you're um, thinking through what to keep or what bees to give to friends or, or to send to us, you're just kind of taking a pile and, and tossing them. But how many do you need? Um, I'd save maybe a hundred or so. In my backyard, I keep maybe a couple hundred, and those turn into, I've got enough holes, wood trays and reeds, 
they turn into again four to six hundred so every year I've got too many bees and if you just kept them all what would happen um, your reeds are going to fill up and those excess bees just fly off in a mile or so direction and we'd, we'd honestly like your bees here to help other people learn what you're learning so uh, so Damaris if you wouldn't mind putting up or Joy putting up the link to our bee buyback program uh, in the chat um, and just to recap if you have extra mason bee cocoons from your harvest this year um, anywhere from a hundred up to five thousand you can send them to us we'll buy them back in exchange for a check or store credit all the information is on our website so there are some pests, uh, parasitic wasps. Uh, could you show that one picture I sent to you? This is mono, and um, it's a it's an awesome little wasp, if you like really cool wasp, that puts its uh, ovipositor stingy thing through um, weaknesses in uh, cracks in reeds, maybe on the ends of wood trays or into paper tubes. And uh, what happens is as they inject their eggs into our larva. Our larva doesn't really do much about it. Spins this cocoon, about halfway spin its cocoon, uh, alien. These gross little larvae all burst out of our mason bee larva and then will habitate uh, inside a cocoon. So it's, uh, we check and we've got a big light board over there that we look through. But if you want to go check your cocoons, and I'm going to say reeds typically don't have this problem. Reeds are typically strong enough to prevent this. But I've just poked a little hole through a cardboard, piece of cardboard, and I've got a really powerful um, light, LED light, that as I put my light through this, I'm able to, I think this is... Um, yeah, that looks good, I can okay. see. So yeah. you can see through here, um, you'll typically see uh, the shape of a bee or you might see uh, 15 or so tiny little maggots. If you look through and see that, you find maggots, throw it away. Okay? And if you miss them, eh, you know, that's just part of nature's way of, of having pests next to your good guys. But this is an option that uh, we do ourselves uh, because it's important that what we send out to you guys that we have um, nothing in there. Okay. Um, Lastly, I'm going to sanitize my cocoons. And, and why do this? Okay, two things that we're nervous about are chalk brood and, and other pathogens. So a while ago, we used to use um, a bleach solution. And, oh man, we asked scientists for years and years, what can we do that doesn't put caustic bleach on our cocoons? And uh, they couldn't come up with anything until about three years ago. We uh, partnered with a company near us uh, for Clean Bee. And it's a HOCl, um, it's a hydrochlorous acid that you can spray in your eyes. Uh, you can, it, it's people and pet safe. But it kills spores and pathogens and diseases and viruses and all these things. Um, so what we do, it's real simple. Um, I'm, we use this very sparingly. I've got my cocoons in front of me. I'm going to spritz just four or five mists on there. I'm moving my cocoons around because I want to kind of get every side. And again, I'm going to be misting these again. And that's it. So these have and been... That, and that just kills the chalk brood right away, right there. It's all awesome. It's just yeah. killing chalk brood and or um, pathogens or viruses or whatever. So, you know, Cornell and Wisconsin are saying, oh, Dave, these things are out there. So we're just trying to keep these things as healthy as possible. Now, you're going to have your bees over winter. Just a quick little lesson on, on what goes on. Inside here is an adult bee. It's, it's fully developed. It's not that larva anymore, nope. right? Fully yeah. developed. And just a bit ago, in its fuel tanks, this, the stored fats inside its, its uh, cavity the bee survives on those stores fats and the, they metabolize those fats through the, through the winter. If it's super warm this winter, their metabolism is higher and they consume those fats quicker. If it's super cold, they consume them slower. Okay? So in the, in the bees, by, in, in the spring, by the end of the season of, of hibernation, the bees are on empty fuel tanks. 
and they come out. So this is kind of nature's way of having these come out. So let me show you an example of um, what could go wrong. If you had a hotter fall or you had a hotter um, earlier spring followed by you know snow or something, you're going to find that these hotter temperatures uh, will have your bees emerge sooner than they can. Or what if you actually want to have a very late spring? What if you want to put bees onto uh, apples or berries and you just left them in your garage? They're going to come out sooner, like maybe in March, and you're not able to uh, have the bees spread through there. Okay? Because the, the temperature directly affects their metabolism rate, right? Correct. So let's just look at a little quick chart. This is a Washington average temperatures during the day from October all the way through May. And so in that average year, we're going to find that the bees, the, the stored fats are going to be slowly consumed. And by the time spring hits, the bees are on an uh, almost empty fuel tank and off they come. Now let's just say that we had an abnormally hotter fall or a super uh, warm spring. The bees, those stored fats, are actually going to consume them faster and actually not be able to survive into when you want them. This is nature, uh, but again, we're trying to work with uh, the best we can do for your bees. So, so here's... If this, so if the spring is basically coming earlier, that'll cause the bees to emerge earlier, right? Correct. So here's this normal temperature, here's maybe abnormal. This is what the fats would look like. So what happens if you actually keep your bees in a refrigerator or a cooler for the entire winter? Now the metabolism is really low, and what you'd find is that your bees will have far more fats later on in the spring. So you're able to um, have them show up for maybe a early May blossoms as well. And this is why we cool our bees. Now, it's not necessary, but this is what we do to keep our bees as healthy as possible. So, two options. You can let nature take its course, and this happens in life, or you can refrigerate them and you can let them come out when you want to. In fact, you can pull bees out early March, late March, early April. And so you're able to release the bees over eight weeks and have bees uh, pollinating for uh, uh, 12 weeks. Okay? And, and people usually do that if they have a specific, uh, like something in their garden or a tree that they want to pollinate, right? Exactly, Carl. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I um, mean, you can do a combination of both. Leave them inside your garage for most of the winter and then just in March, put them in the refrigerator so they're not coming out. It's just, it's super easy. Okay, now storing cocoons, we've got a, um, we've, years ago, I put my cocoons into the fridge and didn't realize that modern frost refrigerators dehydrate things. Oops, that's why we have crisper drawers. And so I, I nailed them. Um, we've developed a simple little um, humidity that I'm putting cocoons into my humidity. Um, I'm putting in just a tablespoon or a teaspoon of water and once a month just checking on it. So I sealed it, it just goes into my fridge. This black little chamber here is, um, is an air filter, the green part keeps the, the, the water down below. If you get uh, mold inside here, mold is an airborne spore. You'll find it comes from cheese and other things in your, uh, into your uh, refrigerator. Uh, they land on cocoons, you might find moldy cocoons. Not a big deal. You're just taking the cocoons out. You're uh, spritzing them again. You're getting them cold in water, uh, rinsing them off, spritzing them with Clean Bee. I would wash the uh, pads with a soapy water solution, toss them back in, little little Clean Bee. And then if this happens once or twice, I might actually put your entire humidity bee just into a lunch sack. There's still airflow through here, spores, you know, mold spores might not just come in. Super easy. If you're going to keep things outside, um, just make sure that you've got a little air going through and um, you, you might find rats and mice in a garage looking for tasty things. You're just going to try to avoid those. Um, here's what I said about moldy cocoons. Spritz them, toss them back. And uh, just to summarize, we think harvesting is a good idea. You've seen a lot of pests. We're trying to help you separate pests from cocoons. We've shown how to open them, how to clean them, how to store them. 
honestly, if you have a lot of extra cocoons, we'd like them. Okay, we're team with you and we'll buy them back from you. We'll exchange, we'll give you a, a store credit. We'll do everything we can to help you be successful. Um, realize this, this is being recorded. So uh, in about an hour, you can watch the whole thing again, see, you know, see the fun of what we're doing. Uh, and you can pass this off to your friends. So thank you. Um, any, okay, are there any questions I can answer that are um, out there, Carl? Um, yeah, hey, Damaris, do you have any questions from people in the chat that we haven't, uh, that we haven't addressed yet? And we will you know, ask away. We'll keep on answering your questions through the week. I mean, but you've got me live. Any pictures at all? Exactly. Yeah, I was just checking uh, Instagram. It doesn't, look, it doesn't look like we have any new last images week had, just last yet. Week we had a few, but um, all right. Yeah, yeah, we did have a few from last week. Um, but again, you can post your images to Instagram with hashtag Cocoon Harvest 2020, and we'll try we'll to ID those for you. Hey, thanks for watching. And from the team here, you've got Carl and Joy and Damaris. We've got, man, a lot of other people that try to make this thing successful. Thank you for uh, watching. Thanks for teaming with us here at Crown Bees. Enjoy your day. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. It looks like we had a nice crowd. Okay, thanks. Uh, looks like from Damaris, we've answered all the questions in the chat. But if you have something that comes up after the show, uh, feel free to open a ticket at support.crownbees.com um, or reach out to us on our socials, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're all there. Um, and before we go, uh, just in the chat, we've got about 90 or so people left. I'd like to see a, a shout out from everyone. Let us know where you're streaming from. Uh, like David said earlier, we usually have this in uh, Seattle, Washington, but this, uh, this year we've taken the opportunity to spread our harvest party across North America. And it's so exciting to see people from all over the United States and Canada. So uh, before you leave, give us a shout out. Let us know the city, state, province where you're from. Uh, thanks again for joining us and visit crownbees.com for the rewind. Hi, Diana from Beaverton, Oregon. Good to see you. Judy, Portland. Evelyn from Bellevue, good to see you. Aster coming in from Vancouver, BC. Thanks for stopping by. Helena in Montana, great to see you. Christy, right here in our backyard in Seattle. I'm seeing a few people uh, post some last minute questions. If we can't get to you in the chat, please feel free to go to support.crownbees.com, open a ticket, send us any pictures. You can also post them to Instagram at hashtag cocoonharvest2020 and we'll help you out there. And for everyone that's asking if you don't have Clean Bee just yet, of course you can get it on our site. Um, but uh, in the meantime, you can just wash them really, really good. Um, and something else, uh, a sneak peek for everyone who's left on the stream right now. Uh, next, uh, October 13th and 14th, there's going to be Crown Days at Crown Bees. For everyone that logs into our site during those days, you get 15% off everything on the website during Crown Days, uh, October 13th and 14th. Hey, Carol in Seattle. Hey, Frank from Smamish. Thanks for joining us.
All right, everybody. Again, I just wanted to say a final thank you for joining us uh, for this How to Harvest Mason Bee Cocoons from Natural Reads with Dave Hunter. Next week, we'll be having a similar live stream, but we'll be going over how to harvest from cardboard tubes. Um, uh, they're going to be cardboard tubes with inserts and without inserts, right, Dave? Yep. Right there. Okay. So join us next week, same time. We'll put the link up on our website and on the socials. And the rewind for this will be up in about one hour. Have a great weekend, everybody.